the Phantom, one of Britain's most powerful sky weapons, worth two million pounds. The pilot is Chris Kemp. To achieve command has taken him three years. It has meant endless study, intensive training, constant practice. He has gone through the toughest selection process to be found in any career. Whatever the aircraft, all flying calls for special ability and flair. But to handle a plane with the power of the Phantom demands much, much more. And that's what this film is all about. Chris Kemp's first contact with the RAF was at Biggin Hill, the famous wartime station in Kent. Along with the thousands of other young men who arrive each year, most of them aspiring pilots, Chris is interviewed, vetted, observed and tested. Chris's orders read, Cadet Kemp, trainee pilot, will report to RAF Henlow. He is on his way. There's a great deal to learn before a cadet receives his commission. The nearest he comes to an aircraft during his four months at Henlow is on the parade ground. Close your eyes and open them. Pilots have to be supremely fit. Rigorous medical examinations test his heart, brain, respiration and his ability to cope with extreme physical and mental stress. The effect of gravity at high speeds, usually known as G, imposes tremendous strain on the pilot. A 10 stone man can suddenly feel 50 stone heavier. Only the highest standard of physical and mental fitness will do. Initial flying training starts at Church Fenton in Yorkshire. Cadet Kemp is now Pilot Officer Kemp. His flying career has begun. The primary trainer is the chipmunk. Dual controlled, it has a cruising speed of around 100 miles an hour. Though Chris takes the front seat, the instructor keeps control. Within seconds, Chris is airborne. All right, Chris. Well, now we're safely airborne. A routine flight for the instructor. A momentous event for Chris. I wonder how it's all. Look round. To the left and to the right. He has, of course, flown many times before, as a passenger. He has flown much higher, certainly faster, but it's never felt quite like this. From now on, though it may look like fun, 
it's all hard work. Regular briefings cover the day's exercises, weather, the limits on altitudes and speeds, and danger areas to be avoided. In flight handling, takeoffs, and the difficult operation of landing are gone over again and again. Every aspect involved with flying the chipmunk is meticulously explained, learned, and practiced. Little by little, Chris is given increasing control until he is flying the chipmunk from takeoff to landing, with the instructor acting simply as an observer. After 12 hours dual training, the instructor decides that Chris is ready for his first solo. Without any warning, Chris is told, you're on your own. Chris will notch up thousands of flying hours in his career and fly many different types of aircraft. But his first solo flight will never be forgotten. The entry in Chris's logbook will read for the first time, Captain in sole command, Pilot Officer Kemp. It's a testing time for him and his instructor. bumpy but safe enough and he's down in one piece But before he gets his wings, Chris must learn to fly the modern way in a jet. He's posted a few miles north to RAF Leaning okay. for jet training. No, right, let's go. Invariably, the first briefing on a station introduces the newcomer to the local area. He is shown the danger zones, flying limits, landmarks and the training circuits. The course will last almost a year. The new aircraft is the Jet Provost much more powerful than the chipmunk, four times as fast. Flying in formation adds a new dimension to his training. Now, as he will do on an operational squadron, he must develop absolute confidence in his wingmates. Maneuvers are carried out on a single word of command from the flight commander. In a spin, the jet provost can lose height at the rate of 11,000 feet a minute. The stresses on the pilot and his machine are enormous. Maneuvers like this are a test of the pilot's competence and his confidence. The course ends with a final handling test. The chief instructor flies with each student and assesses his potential. 
almost every student wants to become a fighter pilot. But only those with special aptitudes are selected. Nicely coordinated, you tackle your whole flying in an aggressive manner, and um, it uh, portends well for Valley, where I know you want to go. And um, I think we've uh, we've done a lot for him. Wings parade, and a proud moment for the graduating pilots. It's the day the Royal Air Force officially recognizes that they are competent to fly. Each successful officer is presented his wings by the Commander-in-Chief of Training Command. Most of the graduates will go on from here to become pilots of bombers, transport aircraft and helicopters. But a few students have been selected for advanced training as fighter pilots. Chris Kemp is one. Kemp, it's a great pleasure to me to be awarding you your wings. I congratulate you. Well done and good luck. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Chris, now Flying Officer Kemp, is posted to RAF Valley in North Wales. The station lies on the edge of the mountains of Snowdonia. A new course, a new aircraft. Well, what do you think it's the Mat, the, the smallest jet in service, and the most manoeuvrable. With a wingspan of only 24 feet and the weight of less than three tons, the Mat can fly faster than the speed of sound and climb to nearly 50,000 feet. Chris's new instructor is Flight Lieutenant Lloyd Gross. There's no reaching across the cockpit. Uh, to select switches. They're all within easy reach, aren't they? True. What is the fuel load on the JP, Chris? Well, about 2,100 pounds. The NAS carries another 1,000 pounds above this. It's back to square one for Chris. Most students find the conversion from straight wing to swept wing flying the most difficult hurdle in training. Chris will spend 40 hours learning the new flying techniques required for swept wing aircraft. His introductory flight will give him some idea of the handling characteristics of the NAT and introduce him to the local landmarks. Just a short trip, but long enough to give him a taste of things to come. Chris is brief for aerobatics. And that is a mile every 10 seconds. So when we're thinking of positioning, bear in mind that if you're flying in the wrong direction, how quickly you can lose contact with your point over the ground. Having completed the four-point roll, how are we going to manoeuvre so that we're over the centre line for the vertical row? Well, if we start on a full power, go up into a wing over, then when we get up to this height, still have full power on, make it as high as possible, the wing over, so that when we come back down here, we're at 5,000 feet with 450 knots, ready for the pull up into the vertical row. That's ideal. Should work out well. Yeah. Well, let's see then. The tiny gnat could almost have been designed purely for aerobatics. It's the aircraft the world famous Red Arrows use. Low-level navigation. 
Christmas fly at 600 feet, reading a map, picking out landmarks and following a set course, all at 400 miles an hour. What was that supposed to be? That's all right. Well, it's a misplaced. It is after from start to It was a bit, yeah. Well, let's go through it now on the wing, whilst it's fresh in your mind. Well, we took off, went over the Great Orm's Head, around to Rill, which is our starting point. We hit this point, OK, tracked down. We went over the Orm Reservoir, instead of going one mile to the left of it. You missed Lake Bala completely. All right, yeah. no problem with that, yeah. except that we then climbed up over this high ground, and anyone with a brain in his head could have seen that we were going over high ground. And what was this lake here to the left? Yeah, but you, on the visibility, which you know, wasn't all that good, you, could, you couldn't really calculate distances. I, I must admit, the high ground there, yeah, I wasn't... I Fine. Think should have all picked right. that up. Yeah. So you didn't pick it up. You came down off the high ground, saw the road on the right, which you wanted, but you didn't notice that it didn't have a railway line there. Continued on, and after six minutes, 40 seconds, you hit this lake, five miles west of the one we wanted to hit. Turned on to the next heading, saw the tower, then realized you were well off track, and picked it up. This yeah. time, this time you were lucky. On a squadron with three or four aircraft, the boss won't be too pleased. So, let it be a lesson to you. Under battle conditions, the fighter pilot may be called upon to knock out a specific strong point. An important part of his training at this stage is learning to fly under the directions of an army officer situated on the ground. Can cross my light now? The army officer, known as the forward air controller, directs aircraft onto specific targets. On a training sortie, the pilot is given a variety of targets which he must identify quickly and then dive down, simulating an attack. Form 1500 meters, bottom right hand corner, your target. It's one thing to find the ground target, but another to hit it accurately. Air-to-ground air. rocket firing is a new skill to be learned. It comes down here, and it's a nice firm pressure to fire the guns on that side. To make it safe, that catch comes to there, which returns the top catch there. The button on this side, the cine button, for taking film. Once you've pressed that button on the sneb, sort it, the film checks automatically. Transfer your thumb then across to this catch there, press the button, and then leave it. And the camera goes until that button there is pressed. I see, those, those are the white flashes that you That's see. That's right, on, on the yeah. film. Okay? The target area is deliberately made small to test the pilot's ability. Four hits. Not bad. Chris has been in the Air Force two and a half years. 
At Coningsby in Lincolnshire, he meets the Phantom for the first time. He has flown chipmunks, jet provosts, gnats and hunters. He has learned how to fly and how to fight in the air. All his training has been directed towards one purpose, to make him an effective fighter pilot, a Phantom pilot. You'd be here for about five months to complete the course, and when you finish that five months course, you should be a competent Phantom pilot. The first piece will be the ground school, where we'll teach you about the aircraft systems and about emergencies, and the second part will be flying in the Phantom simulator. We'll then teach you something about the radar, and finally we'll teach you something about self-defense in the aircraft, flying in formation with the other aircraft. The six pan uh, firing handle, which is for Mark 5 seat only, so you need to worry about that one. And then the last check, as far as the pilot's concerned, is the canopy, which we won't close at the moment for obvious reasons. CW radar switch to standby, that's the large knob on there. Up. One, up. That's it. Okay. Radar function switch. And radar A major part of phantom training is concerned with armaments. This is the C-23A gun. If you were willing to want to fire it, the first action you would have to do is get the flywheel to run to speed. If you press the release switches, at the bomb station select switches, to select the stations you wish to fire, and then Press the bomb, pickle, bomb release button, and as you're doing this, if you look up at the station in the thinny, you will see the order in which the bombs will release. The Phantom is more complicated and much more difficult to handle than any of the aircraft Chris has flown so far. His first lessons take place in a simulator. This is a full-scale model of the Phantom's controls and cockpit. It enables the pilot, briefed and observed by instructors, to learn how to fly accurately and safely without the hazards of actual flight. The simulator reproduces in vision and sound all the characteristics of a Phantom on an operational exercise. The illusion is realistic and vivid. Are we having problems, sir? The wall map represents the terrain around Coningsby. Linked to the simulator's controls, a television camera moves across the map, relaying the picture to screens. Two five seven, two five seven. Fly steady rate of descent, very slightly left of the centre line. Two six two. Make a heading now. Two six two. The workload is increased progressively. The pilot's response to instructions is observed on duplicate instruments. Every change of angle, height, and speed on the imaginary flight is faithfully and realistically reproduced. Chris's reactions to emergency situations are measured. Even bailouts are simulated. At the end of an exercise, the pilot often emerges covered in nervous perspiration. But there's nothing like the real thing. Chris's first phantom flight begins with a pre-flight check. The aircraft has, of course, been fully serviced. But it is the pilot's responsibility to make his own personal inspection before every takeoff. But there's a catalyst in the centre and no white metal deposits around the outside. And then we turn, looking at the general condition of the top surface of the wing, to the uh, tip of the wing, and checking that this light is uh, in a good condition. And then coming to the tank, give it a tap, and from the frequency you can tell, just by tapping it, whether it's full or not. This is the Phantom, a flying armory. It can carry, in various permutations, 11 1,000-pound bombs, over 200 armor-piercing rockets, four Sparrow air-to-air -air radar-guided missiles, four Sidewinder infrared missiles, and a 20-millimeter gun which fires 100 rounds a second. It can cruise at almost the speed of sound. In overdrive, it is capable of more than twice the speed of sound. 
There are months of hard, concentrated training before Chris is assigned a posting. Takeoffs, sorties, landings, and more exercises. Well, on this map now. We'll just have a look and see if you can find something which has vertical extent and which is unique, which is something over a minute away, which should be easily found and therefore suitable as an initial point. There's glaze over there, which isn't much good, and the distance is no good. There's more. No. His full throttle, the phantom speed accelerates to 1,400 miles an hour. Chris's posting is to 54 Squadron. It has a celebrated reputation and a mascot. Come on, sir. Hello, Chris. Glad to know you. Hello, there. We're going to fly together, aren't we? For a That's while. right, yeah. Probably Great. Probably. How do you find the OCU? Sorry? They don't give me too many grey hairs. Grey hairs? I've done enough already. Tradition and social activities are part of squadron life. Unmarried officers live in the mess, while married officers live in quarters on or near the station. But they all come together socially on occasions such as this, a mess cocktail party. Flying Officer Kemp's formal training is over. He is now a squadron pilot. The Phantom is too much for one man to handle. It is never flown solo. The pilot flies in the front cockpit, the navigator in the rear cockpit. Training continues on the squadron, but now the emphasis is on teamwork between pilot and navigator. They must have absolute confidence in each other. Flying at the speed of sound leaves no margin for error. They must learn to think and act as one. The basic ingredients of a good crew are loyalty and trust, based on the competence of each member. Teamwork is at its most crucial during night flying, when the Phantom hurtles into the darkness at supersonic speeds. must remain at all times an efficient fighting force. This is achieved by constant exercises involving all aspects of operational life. An emergency landing is a full-scale operation. In this exercise, the Phantom has a reported brake failure. 
On the alarm given from the control tower, fire engines, ambulances and other supporting rescue vehicles are rushed to position on the runway. The Phantom will land aircraft carrier style. Its emergency landing hook must link up with a steel wire stretched across the runway. This simple device brings the Phantom to a complete stop within seconds of touchdown. Pilots and rescue teams know their place and the job they have to do. Faced with real emergencies, lives could depend on it. Armament train. Four pods, each carrying 50 armor-piercing rockets, are fitted to the Phantom. They are live and handled with care. The Phantom is a fighter bomber, an aircraft capable of delivering rockets bombs and missiles, and then fighting its way home. It has the punch of a heavyweight and the speed of a flyweight. Singapore on a three-week exercise. During the eight and a half thousand mile journey, the squadron will need to be refueled several times. Most of the refueling takes place in flight. The fuel tanker is the victor. At the rendezvous point, the Phantoms wait while the refueling hose reels up. The basket at the end of the hose is designed to keep it stable. The Phantom closes in. The probe through which the fuel will be pumped into the Phantom is extended. The pilot edges his Phantom towards the victor. The maneuver calls for the utmost skill. Too fast an approach and damage would be sustained to the Phantom. Too slow and the probe would not engage in the holes. The tankers can refuel as many as three aircraft at one time. The strategic advantages of this maneuver in times of hostility are obvious. Should an airfield be put out of action, airborne refueling would ensure that the squadron could still operate.
after almost a full day's flight. Singapore. Overseas detachments and postings are an integral part of squadron life. This detachment is to a tropical zone. The next could be somewhere in polar regions. Meanwhile, the spice and the sights of the Orient are quite an experience. Back to business once more. The purpose of the detachment is to familiarize crews with all types of terrain, conditions and climates. The sortie today consists of two phantoms directed by an airborne forward air controller operating from a helicopter. He will direct the phantoms onto their jungle targets. A closer look at the jungle where trees can grow as high as 250 feet, shows the need for the controller to be airborne. A man on the ground would simply not be seen. So much for Singapore. Next time, it could be Iceland, the Middle East, or any one of a hundred places. For Chris, it is an ambition achieved and the start of a long career. For a considerable time to come, the entry in his log will read, Captain in command, Chris Kemp, Phantom Pilot.